have some good news. Ray and Jenny Walls want to place membership with us. Praise God for that. Yeah. They will be a blessing to us. You know, it seems like every week or two we're announcing either a baptism or someone placing membership. Don't take that for granted. I mean, God is doing good things in this place. I've never seen anything like it. How far he's brought us to his glory. And uh, just so delighted to have them and to have all of you. I can't wait to see what God's going to do next. And then... In three weeks, we're going to have a special service in Everyone Bring One Day, Sunday, November the 13th. We had a couple of these in our past buildings, but this will be the first time as North Point. Now, in the past, members have done a great job of buying in. You've participated, and I sure hope you'll do so this time. We're asking that you hone in on at least one person, and preferably more, and make it your mission to get them to come that day. They will hear a sermon that will build them up, that could save their soul. We're going to move our love feast to that day. It'll be uh, the Thanksgiving edition, turkey and dressing. But we're going to have this special service aimed at bringing in those that we come in contact with on a regular basis. So that Sunday, November the 13th, please buy into this. Pick out at least one person, perhaps more, and try to get them here on that Sunday. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we bow before you on another Lord's Day, a day of victory, a day of celebration. This was the day in which Jesus Christ conquered the grave to never die again. We praise you for that. We love you for that. And we're so thankful that we can share in the victory of his resurrection. Father, we pray for this service, that it will be a sweet-smelling sacrifice to you, And we pray for our upcoming Everyone Bring One Day. Father, help us to step out of our comfort zone. Help us to love people enough to invite them that day. And we pray, Father, providentially that they'll come and they might be saved. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week I was studying through the life of David when I came across a story that truthfully almost made me tear up. I'd read the story before, but it's such a tender moment in the life of David. There's so much compassion and kindness and loyalty that that as I started to picture the scene, I almost got a little emotional. It's also a story of grace. Someone bestowing great favor on the forgotten. We could also point out that this story, the one we're going to look at today, encapsulates the gospel hundreds of years before there was the gospel. I hope I've tapped into your curiosity. If you're wondering what story that is, it's 2 Samuel chapter 9. Now by this time, David was the king of Israel and things were going really well. God had blessed him to be extremely victorious over his enemies. In fact, the last line of 2 Samuel 8 verse 14 says, And the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. Now isn't that a stunning statement? The Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. This was a high point in David's reign. He was strong, the nation was strong. Well, it was at this time that David started doing some reflecting. He remembered his predecessor, King Saul. David had a turbulent relationship with King Saul, but David had always respected him. David had tried to be loyal to him. And David was extremely close with his son, Jonathan. They were best friends and more. You couldn't get closer than David and Jonathan. So at this moment, David begins to reflect. He thinks back on Saul and Jonathan, and his spirit is stirred within him. He has this deep desire to show kindness to the house of Saul. And that led him to ask this question. 2 Samuel 9, beginning in verse 1. And David said, Is there still anyone left of the house of Saul 
that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now, there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, I am your servant. And the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan. He is crippled in his feet. So David is there. He's thinking back on his relationship with Jonathan. And he says to himself, I want to show kindness to somebody. One of Jonathan's relatives, for Jonathan's sake. Now, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew. We speak English. And sometimes the power of a word is lost in translation. And I think it's certainly true with the word kindness here. David wanted to show someone kindness. Now, if I'm driving down the interstate and I see a car put on its blinker and I brake so they can merge over, that's an act of kindness, right? I was kind to that person. But that doesn't even come close to capturing the meaning of this word. The Hebrew word is pronounced hased. Hased. And it's defined as a deep sense of love and loyalty for someone that inspires acts of goodwill. Some translate this word as unfailing love. Or as faithful love. So it's more than just our English word, kindness. So here's David. He's thinking about his relationship with Jonathan. He wants to show kindness to one of Jonathan's relatives. And so he asks, is there anybody left from the house of Saul? Well, if anybody knew the answer to that question, it would be a man named Ziba. He lived nearby, and he had worked for Saul. He was one of Saul's servants. So they summon Ziba, and David asks, Are you Ziba? And he says, Yes, sir, I am, and I'm your servant. He said, Ziba, I want to show kindness to someone in Saul's house. Is there anybody still living? Ziba said, Well, actually, there is. Jonathan had a son, and that son is still living, though he's crippled. I wonder what David thought at that moment. Wow, my best friend Jonathan has a son? I didn't know he was still living. Now, Ziba tells him that he's living, but he's handicapped. We don't have to wonder what happened, the circumstances of his disability. If you back up just a few chapters to chapter 4, we have a verse that in context is really just parenthetical. It's part of a broader context. But this verse tells us why Jonathan's son was crippled. 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. Jonathan, the son of Saul, had a son who was crippled in his feet. He was five years old when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And as she fled in her haste, he fell and became lame. And his name was Mephibosheth. Jonathan, Mephibosheth's dad, and King Saul, Mephibosheth's grandpa, had been off at war. It's called the Battle of Mount Gilboa. This was near the Jezreel Valley. And while they were fighting this war, Jonathan and Saul are both killed. Word gets back to the house that they're dead. Mephibosheth's nurse hears the news and panics. Do you know why she panicked? Because there was a typical protocol that existed. If you took out a king... You followed that up by taking out all of the king's descendants. Saul's dead. Jonathan's dead. Mephibosheth is next in line. They're probably going to come for him. So his nurse, he's five years old, his nurse immediately scoops him up and begins to run away when she either trips or she drops him. 
and both of his legs are crippled. He's unable to walk anymore. Now, if you've had any experience with a five-year-old, I've had a little bit. Five-year-olds are usually pretty fast runners. And I wonder, why would this lady feel like she has to pick him up and run? Why not just say, hey, Mephibosheth, let's run. We got to go. He might be able to outrun her, right? Well, the name Mephibosheth is an interesting name. There are a couple different ways it could be rendered in terms of meaning. But one meaning is shameful breath. If you're looking for Bible names for a child, I wouldn't recommend Mephibosheth. Shameful breath. I actually looked it up just to see, out of curiosity, what are the most popular Bible names for babies. Here are the top five for boys. Elijah, James, Benjamin, Ethan, and Alexander. Top five for girls. Abigail, Elizabeth, Chloe, Hannah, Leah. I like all of those names. Mephibosheth doesn't make the list. Not only is it hard to pronounce, but it means shameful breath. Well, what's my point? Some believe, based on the fact that his name means shameful breath, and based on the fact that she felt compelled to pick up a five-year-old boy rather than just letting him run by himself, that Mephibosheth may have had asthma or some kind of breathing trouble. The Bible doesn't say that, we can't know for sure, but the meaning of his name plus the fact that she picked him up rather than just letting him run may give validity to that. Nevertheless, at five years old, isn't this sad? At five years old, this this boy has both of his legs broken and he's permanently crippled. Well, now many years have passed. And unbeknownst to David, he's still living. And David wants to show him kindness. I think it's interesting, our text says more than once that David wants to show him kindness for Jonathan's sake. Do you notice that? For Jonathan's sake. There was a little boy named Ryan, and Ryan started at a new school. And he came home and he said, Mom, he said, "Uh, there's this lady in the cafeteria And she's really nice to me. She smiles. She gives me extra food on my plate. But she doesn't do it for anybody else. When the other kids ask for food, or extra food, she says, no. I don't even have to ask, though. She just smiles and gives me extra food. His mom thought that was a little odd, but didn't think too much about it. But this kept going on day after day. Ryan would come home and say, Mom, she did it again. She's mean to the other kids, but she really likes me. And so one day, the curiosity just got to be too much, and so she went to school with him. They walked in the cafeteria, and his mom said, okay, point out this lady to me. He said, there she is. The mom walked over to her and said, can I ask you a question? The lady said, sure. She said, do we know each other? And the lady said, no, we don't. But I know that you're Miss Hensley's granddaughter. And years ago, Miss Hensley made sure that me and my kids had everything we need. And when I found out that Ryan was one of her descendants, I just felt compelled to be nice to him for her sake. That's David, right? That's David. David wants to be nice to somebody in Jonathan's family for Jonathan's sake because he loves Jonathan. Their souls, the Bible says, were knit together. I love that. And remember the promise David made. Do you remember that? Years earlier, when David and Jonathan were much younger men, they made a covenant. And part of that covenant was, David, you'll show love to me and to my descendants forever. Let me show you. It's 1 Samuel 20, verses 14 and 15. Jonathan said years ago, If I am still alive, show me the steadfast love. There's hesed, the Hebrew word. Show me the steadfast love of the Lord, that I may not die. 
And do not cut off your steadfast love from my house forever. When the Lord cuts off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. I can't help but think that David remembered that promise. He promised to love Jonathan as long as he lived and to love his offspring. Well, here's his chance, right? And so he calls in Ziba. He finds out Jonathan has a living son, and David's excited. Notice verse 4. The king said to him, that is Ziba, where is he? (laughs) Where is this guy living? And Ziba said to the king, he is in the house of Makar, the son of Emil, at Lodabar. Then King David sent and brought him from the house of Makar, the son of Emil, at Lodabar. And Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, came to David and fell on his, on his face and paid homage. Where is this guy? Jonathan has a son? Where is he? Ziba said he's in Lodabar. Now that's pitiful. Lodabar was on the east side of the Jordan River, and the term literally means place of no pasture. This guy had been a descendant of royalty. His grandpa had been king of Israel. His dad was a prince. And now here he is living in Lodabar. Isn't that sad? Crippled, away from his home, living in Lodabar. Well, King David immediately sent for him. Now, I can imagine when the soldiers arrived in Lodabar and began asking questions, um, we're looking for someone. Can you tell us where Jonathan's son lives? Can you tell us where Mephibosheth is at? Well, they find Mephibosheth, and they say, King David wants to see you. I would imagine at that moment, Mephibosheth's jaw dropped, His heart sank, and his brow started to sweat. Do you know why? Because usually, when one regime goes out and another comes in, the current regime takes out the former. If there are any descendants, they're dead meat. And so Mephibosheth probably thought, oh no, here it is, he's finally caught up to me. Can you imagine... They probably had to carry him. Can you imagine him being carried in and seeing David? Mephibosheth immediately falls at his feet and pays homage. This is a sign of humility and reverence. He's worshiping David. And then David uttered three words. I want you to notice 2 Samuel 9, picking up in 6b. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold, I am your servant. And David said to him, here they are, Do not fear. Don't be afraid. For I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always. And he paid homage and said, What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog such as I? So as as Mephibosheth is there on the floor, worshiping David, David says, Son, don't be afraid. I'm not here to hurt you. I'm not going to kill you except with kindness, David said. I've brought you here so I can show kindness to you for the sake of your dad. I loved your dad. We were best friends. Your dad saved my life, and I promised that I'd always be good to him and his descendants. Mephibosheth, I haven't brought you here to hurt you. I've brought you here to bless you. I'm going to give you back your inheritance. I'm going to restore to you all the land of Saul, and you'll eat at my table always. Can you imagine what Mephibosheth was thinking at that moment? Am I hearing this right? You've got to be kidding me. 
I'm living over in Lodabar as an outcast. And now the king has called for me with news that he's going to give me my whole inheritance. And I'm welcome to eat at his table. How often? For the day? No. For the weekend? No. Always. David said, you shall eat at my table always. And I love Mephibosheth's response. Humble, deferential. What is your servant that you should show regard for a dead dog like me? He considered himself to be worthless and totally unworthy of this kind of blessing. Well, Verse 9, then the king called Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that belong to Saul and to all his house I have given to your master's grandson. And you and your sons and your servants shall till the land for him and shall bring in the produce, that your master's grandson may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's grandson, shall always eat at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so will your servant do. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. After David addressed Mephibosheth, he turns back to Ziba. He says, Ziba, you used to work as a servant for Saul, right? Yes, you're back in business. Now you're going to work for his grandson. I want you and your sons and your servants to till the land for him so he always has enough to eat. But he's not really going to have to worry about that because he's going to be eating at the king's table always. Ziba said, yes, sir, I'm glad to do it. I love that last line, verse 11. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. Like what? Like one of the king's sons. Like what? Like one of the king's sons. He wasn't a natural born son to David. He was an adopted son. And he was going to share the same rights and privileges that the other sons have. Don't you see why this is such a touching story? I mean, you think back on the long history of David and Jonathan... They had been best friends through thick and thin. Jonathan had tragically been killed in war. Jonathan's precious five-year-old son falls and is handicapped. He's been living across the Jordan in Low Debar, the place of no pasture, all of these years. Forgotten, right? He'd been forgotten. Few people even know that he was still alive. He's the son of royalty, but he's living like a reject. I don't want to sound wimpy, but as I got to thinking about that story, I'm like, man, this just kind of touches my heart. And here comes David to save the day. This is the gospel encapsulated, isn't it? This is a foreshadowing of what God does with us through Jesus and it's a story of amazing grace. Let me, let me just go over this with you. Disgrace to grace. Mephibosheth was broken from a fall, right? Physically speaking, he had been crippled. He was no longer able to walk. He was totally dependent on others. He was broken from a fall. Number two, he was living as an outcast. He was part of a rejected family. He had been displaced and disgraced. And three, he was dwelling in emptiness. He was living in low debar, the place of no pasture. A place where there would be no lasting satisfaction. But then grace appeared, right? He was sought out by the king. The king took the initiative. 
Not Mephibosheth. It was the king who took the initiative. It was the king's love that led the way. Number two, he was shown unmerited favor. He did nothing to earn or deserve this blessing. He didn't work his way back into the king's favor. This was an undeserved blessing. And number three, he was treated as a son with the same rights and privileges of a natural-born son. He shared in their benefits and blessings. Can you not see the parallel with us? That's us! We're children of the king by adoption. And think about our story. This is the story of all Christians. We were in a state of disgrace. We had been broken from a fall, right? Not physically speaking, but spiritually speaking. We'd been crippled by sin. We were no longer able to walk right. Ecclesiastes said that God made us upright. But when we sin, we can no longer walk upright. And we lose our ability to be with the king. We were living as an outcast. When we sinned, when transgression separated us from God, we were part of a rejected family. The Bible calls us at that point sons of disobedience. We too were displaced and disgraced. And like Mephibosheth, we were dwelling in emptiness. When your sin separates you from God, guess where you end up living? In Lodabar. You're in Lodabar. You're in a place of emptiness. You are in a state that offers no permanent satisfaction. That's us. That's every Christian before their conversion. But then grace appeared. We were sought out by the king. We didn't take the initiative. He did. John says we love him. Why? Because he first loved us. His love led the way. We were shown unmerited favor. We didn't do anything to earn or deserve God's blessings. We could never work hard enough or long enough or good enough. It's all by His grace. And as a result, we're treated as a son with the same rights and privileges of a natural-born son. You see, Jesus is the only natural-born son of God. We're sons and daughters by adoption. And when he adopted us into his family, guess what he did? He cleared a spot at the table. He said, that that place is for you. You have all the blessings and benefits of a natural born son. That's why they call the good news the good news. This is a story of grace, and it's a foreshadowing of the grace we enjoy through Jesus Christ. And so, brethren, I want to say, we are Mephibosheth. I am Mephibosheth. You are Mephibosheth. We are Mephibosheth. Ours, too, is a story of grace. And I can't praise God enough for that. And I would say to you, if you're here this morning and you're not part of those blessings, you're living in low debar. And who wants to live in low debar? If you're living in low debar this morning, the king is calling for you to come. You've been summoned. And the king's not calling you to hurt you. He's calling to help you. In Mephibosheth's case, It was for the sake of his father, Jonathan. In our case, it's for the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ. It saddens me, it really does, to see the world walking around crippled. Now, you might not see them limping. They may may not be on crutches or in a wheelchair. But in the sight of God, they're crippled. They've been crippled by a fall. And as a result, they're wandering aimlessly in low to bar. And we're saying, you don't have to do that. There's a better way. The king wants to bless you. We've got a good crowd this morning, but why isn't this place overflowing with people? 
We're offering the best message you could ever offer. You don't have to live in Lodabar anymore. The king wants to give you a blessing. Well, if you're here this morning and you're in Lodabar and you want to be right with God, the offer still stands. Do you believe in Jesus enough to act upon that belief? Are you willing to turn from the world to confess your faith in Jesus before others? I'll do it for you. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It's that easy. And then be baptized in water for the forgiveness of sins. If you'll take those simple steps, you'll rise up cleansed, saved, and you can look forward to an eternal home at the Lord's table. It's all by His grace. And we call you to accept that grace by coming forward right now as we stand and sing.